And the siddhas that you that you were talking about, so I always imagined they were in the Himalayas. I didn't think they were going to be in South India. Or is that yes. rish- like what are the rishis? We always say, oh, it's the rishis, the the seers of the mantras. I always pictured them in Himalay in the Himalayas. So there's a northern and southern tradition um, Mm -hmm. here in India, and um, like the northern tradition of India came up with um, Ayurvedic medicine, which was my original training, Um, and then the southern tradition of India is the Siddha medicine, and so, you know, maybe splitting hairs just a little bit of, uh, well, you have the rishis on the mountains versus you know, the Siddhas in the South, but I guess the difference is the Siddhas in particular, especially the ones that developed the Siddha medicine philosophy, um, they were particularly interested in the quantum phenomenon of biology. So biology at a quantum level. And so when you dive into that, mantras become particularly important. So the Siddhas were preoccupied in a sense with immortality, how to create immortality um, through biology. And so it's a slightly different path, I guess you would say. I I, I always look at them as the quantum biologists of the Rishis, that they not only wanted to understand the truth, but they wanted to get their hands dirty a little bit um, in the laboratory of life and actually figure out how it all worked. And they are very specific, like you, you chant this mantra for this physical condition or, or whether like that? It's, it's, so that's partly what we're finding out right now is we're going through the, the records are, um, we don't actually have a timeline for them. They're written on pieces of bark um, and palm leaves in a language that is extinct and they're written in code. So there's lots of lots of little hurdles to overcome in the translation. <laughs> uh-huh. But the way that they use the mantras is, for example, even in the preparation, um, like there's a particular to the herb that, so normally for the rishis, you would think of doing long meditation to get to the point where you can levitate, correct? For the siddhas, they came up with formulations that would allow somebody to meditate. So in the, for, in the creation of even that formulation, they would chant specific mantras as they were making the formulation. So it it goes beyond just mantras for specific conditions. They actually used mantras to change the nature of matter so that it was infused with unique properties, such as the ability for the person consuming it to be able to levitate. You can say that they matched mantra to, yeah, I guess it's matching mantra to matter, really, that yeah. this mantra will transform this particular aspect of matter in such a way that would allow for this particular, you know, ability. I always imagine that, you know, especially kind of my nerdy scientist side, that they would just have been the most interesting scientists on the planet, essentially. Yeah. You know, they were just doing, you know, interesting things just because I think they were enamored with... Um, with, with life. They were enamored with life, even through the lens of, of biology. Yeah. And they would... Sorry. sorry, this was the Sanskrit language? No, this is actually not a Sanskrit language. Oh. It's um, a language that is said to be even older than Sanskrit. Wow. Well, what's it called? Um, you know, I... <laughs> I don't have the Tamil word for it right in front of me. <laughs> and I don't does it to sound like, like the mantras that we know in the West, or is it like a total... Yes, yes, so the mantras actually are in Sanskrit. Um, it's just that the text is not all written oh, in Sanskrit. Oh, okay. Yes, the mantras are in Sanskrit, but the text itself is not written in Sanskrit. Okay. Oh, this is amazing. Um, and what about chanting them out loud versus just within... Like when they when they did their formulas, would you think they would have chanted them out loud, or just to carry them within would have been oh, enough? That's a very good question. I asked my spiritual teacher about this. Um, some of the formulations we've made, the mantras have been chanted out loud, and um, what she said is that when you are trying to transform mainly yourself or you're alone, chanting them within has the greatest um, effect. When you chant them out loud, you're trying to charge something, whether that be a piece of metal, whether that is an oil, whether that is an herb. So the chanting out loud is using the prana or the life force 
to charge a particular object. So in the preparation of herbs, then you would chant out loud. Mm -hmm. 